Welcome, everyone. Glad to be with you once again. Adam Andrews from Christ Reformed Church in Colville, Washington, but since the dawn of the age of Corona, uh, in all places where Facebook exists. Glad to have you uh, with us today. I'm excited about the reminder that we're going to get this morning of the good news of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And uh, I can't wait to deliver it, but I wanna make sure that my chat is working first. Very good. So um, today, what I'd like to do is uh, glory a little bit more in the good news that comes to us uh, in the death of Jesus. And um, I guess the, the, the thing I wanna say about that to begin is that we've been looking at a lot of passages from the New Testament uh, in recent weeks, the one about the watchful servants, the one about the lilies of the field and the ravens of the air. And the passages that we've been talking about um, have all emphasized the idea of a, a passive waiting on God as the principal activity of the Christian life or the principal mechanism of the gospel's delivery. The way you receive the gospel is you sit and wait passively for it. And I want to talk about some of the implications of that idea and maybe some of the ways that it rankles and rubs us the wrong way a little bit. But before I get into that, would you uh, pray with me that our discussion today is a fruitful one? Lord, we come before you um, gathered together physically and virtually and thank you for the opportunity to be reminded corporately of your great love and faithfulness. Lord, thank you for uh, the death of Jesus uh, in which we all die and in which we all experience resurrection. I pray that you would teach that deep mystery to our hearts as we discuss your gospel today. And I pray that it would fill them with joy because of the of the great nature of your love and salvation. In Jesus name we pray it. Amen. Amen. So the idea then of the principal activity of the Christian life being a waiting fits in, I think, with the overarching theme of death actually as the focus of Jesus's message. The good news of the gospel it turns out is odd in this way. It's good news about death as the only passageway to salvation, about death as the necessary prerequisite to resurrection, about death as the condition for life eternal. As Jesus died to save the world, so we are taught in his parables and in the whole gospel of Luke that we've been talking about for the last many weeks, we are taught to act as dead men ourselves, to die figuratively in imitation of Jesus, or to wait as dead men for his grace and for the deliverance of his resurrection. A far cry from hearing in the gospel how you're supposed to get about doing it. It turns out that the harder we search, the more we uncover a disquieting lesson. There's nothing to do at all. Jesus has come with free grace for the dead. Jesus has come with life for the dead. Jesus has come with resurrection for the dead. And to get these things, we only have to be dead. And this is a potentially offensive message. I just want to go ahead and say it. I want to point out the fact that this message is potentially offensive to us, especially if like me, the preacher, harps on it week after week and rides it like a hobby horse. Makes him sound like a simpleton is what it does. And it also lays him open to the rather obvious charge that he's not considering the whole counsel of the scriptures. He's not telling the whole story because those scriptures appear to be filled with moral and ethical instructions and with threats of judgment and with a preoccupation, you might say, with how to live the good life. But this message of death also rankles for a deeper reason, I think. It seems to ignore something very deep in our hearts. It ignores an urge that we all have that drives us to church, that drives us to fellowship, that drives us to God in the scriptures and in worship. It drives us to listen to preaching in the first place. And because we've come to God driven by this urge, 
to have God represented to us as ignoring that urge is frankly a little offensive. And the urge that I want to talk about is this. The urge that we all have that drives us to hear about the gospel, that drives us to hear from God, is the urge to hear a judgment. We are driven by an urge, by a need to hear a judgment. To hear a judgment on the good life and to learn the path to the good life. We want to know at the deepest level that we have done well. And oddly enough, and I'll bet you will, you will identify with me here, we also want to know just as deeply that we have done poorly. We crave judgment and sentencing even. At our deepest level in our hearts, we want to hear, this is who you are, for this is what you've done. And this is how you must now live as a consequence. I think we have that all in common. And surely God knows better than anyone what the verdict on those questions really is. And without his final word, we're just left torturing ourselves continually with presumptive conjectural judgments. I must have done that wrong, which can be extended to, I always do that wrong. For years, for my whole life, I have done wrong in this area. Or, conversely, I surely did that one right. I hope I've done that one right. I usually do that right. Is that right good enough? This is the kind of judgment that we crave. This is the thing that brings us to a spiritual service, as our governor is now calling it. And because the gospel says, you are the beloved child of God because of Jesus' death, in his utter defeat, God has issued the last two judgments that ever apply to you, guilty and not guilty. Because of Jesus' intercession, because of his interposition, because of his standing in the way of God's judgment, because of his taking on of the guilty judgment and delivering to you vicariously and free for nothing the not guilty judgment, your life of deeds, past, present, future, turns out not to be a factor in either verdict. Because that is the message of the gospel, and because we come to hear it with this deep-seated need and urge to hear a judgment, it somehow fails to give us what we crave. And something inside us objects, if we're honest. Something inside us claims, hey, whatever happened to the positive idea of Christian living? If all we have to do is be saved and drop dead, why bother even trying to live? Especially why bother trying to be good or loving or moral? What role does the gospel leave for religion, for ethical training, if everybody's going to get home free for nothing? And by the way, isn't this message of grace, life coming out of death, an incentive to sin? With no attention paid to right and wrong and the moral law, why not just go out and sin all we like? How is this presentation productive? Well, I want to interrupt that train of thought now because I think it tends to drift away fairly quickly from the most telling objection that I've kind of raised here, which is that the gospel's failure to deal with the legitimate subject of Christian living. But let me try and lay aside those other two objections first. First of all, what role does this presentation of the gospel, that we wait like flowers in the field, that we watch like servants at the gate, for God to come with life and resurrection on his initiative without anything to do with us, what role does this presentation leave for religion? And it's such a pleasure to get to say this, once more to people listening for the gospel. It leaves no role at all 
for religion. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is the announcement of the end of all religion. You see, religion consists of all the things, believing, behaving, worshiping, sacrificing, that the human race has ever thought it had to do to get right with God. And Christianity says about all those things, the sacrificing and everything it symbolizes, it says two things about those. First of all, none of them ever had the least chance of doing the trick. They were never going to work. The blood of bulls and goats can never take away our sins, as the epistle of Hebrews tells us. And no effort of ours to keep the law of God can ever succeed, as the epistle of the Romans tells us. The second thing Christianity says about all the works of religion is that everything it tries and fails to do has been perfectly done already, once and for all, by Jesus in his death and resurrection. And so, for Christians, the entire religion shop has been closed, boarded up, and forgotten. The church is not in the religion business, it turns out. It never has. It never will be, in spite of all the churchmen through 2,000 years who've acted as if religion were their stock in trade. The church instead is in the gospel proclaiming business. The church is not here to bring the world the bad news that God will think kindly about us only after we've gone through certain ethical and liturgical steps and wickets and tests. The church is not here to bring that bad news. It's here to bring the good news that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The church is here, in other words, for no religious purpose at all, only to announce the gospel of free grace. So much for the objection that the gospel of grace leaves no room for religion. Objections sustained. The other objection that I want to deal with first, which is, why doesn't this gospel of grace just an incentive to sin? Why not go on sinning as much as we like? I think that objection can be laid to rest rather quickly. The reason for not going out and sinning all you like is the same as the reason for not going out and putting your nose in a slicing machine. It's dumb. It's stupid. It's no fun. Now, some individual sins may have pleasure still attached to them, <laughs> right? Because of the, well, I'd say because of the residual goodness of the realities that they are counterfeits of, the realities that they are abusing, right? I mean, we can all agree, adultery can indeed be pleasant. Tying one on of an evening can amuse. But the inevitable results of these activities, betrayal, jealousy, love grown cold, the gray dawn of the morning after the night before. These are nobody's idea of a good time. It turns out that this world of gods operates on his laws, physical and moral alike. And it operates so completely on these laws that they look an awful lot like cause and effect. The reason we shouldn't go out and just sin all we like, is that that leads to unpleasant consequences. On the other hand, there's no real use belaboring that point, because if you're honest, you will agree that it never stopped anybody. Neither did religion, by the way. The notion that people won't sin as long as you keep them well supplied with guilt and holy terror is a bit overblown, I think. Giving the human race religious reasons for not sinning is about as useful, I think, as reading lectures to a dog in heat. We have always, all of us men, in the pinches, done just exactly as we dang well please. 
And I'll say something else about that. God has let us do it, generally speaking. God's answer to sin is not to scream, stop that. God's answer to sin is to shut up once and for all on the subject in the death of Jesus. Because of Jesus' death, and since Jesus' death, God's answer to sin has been, I am satisfied. Furthermore, the usual objection to God's relative silence on this subject, which is namely that people will take such graciousness on the part of God as permission to sin, is equally stupid. For one thing, God is absolutely sovereign over all his work. And so we already have his permission. Ever thought about that before? Not his advice, mind you. Not his consent. Not his enthusiasm, necessarily. But definitely his permission. And for another thing, few of us at the point of sinning actually run around looking for people to sign permission slips anyway. We just go right ahead on our own, don't we? I mean, isn't that the kind of the point of sin? That you're doing it without permission, without asking for permission? And finally, the whole idea of people actually being encouraged by the agony and death of Jesus on the cross to seduce maidens, tell lies, and pursue debauchery is simply ludicrous. The truth is that we ourselves thank you very much, are all the encouragement we need for dastardly deeds. Away with the objection, therefore, that the gospel of grace is tacit permission to sin. Really, if these two objections are thus satisfied, all that's really left is kind of an unhappy suspicion on my part that people who are afraid of the preaching of grace afraid that it will encourage sin, may be people who resent the righteousness they have forced themselves into. Having led good lives, and worse yet, having denied themselves the pleasures of sin, they seethe inwardly at any suggestion that God may not be as hard on drug pushers and child molesters as they always thought he would be. The God may not be as hard on sinners as they always imagine he would be on them. We don't imagine that God will be forgiving, it turns out. And we've lived long with this assumption, like a burden on our hearts, like a weight on our shoulders. The assumption that he's out to get us. The assumption that he's keeping track. The assumption that our long history of doing it wrong will eventually come around to bite us. How if laborers newly arrived in the vineyard... Don't have to carry that burden. Well, it's not fair. But enough of religion and morality. Those two weak subjects for real living. Those weak substitutes, I ought to say, for real living. What about the other objection? What about the really considerable objection? The charge that in exalting death as the means of grace, the gospel neglects the subject of Christian living, of life generally. Shouldn't the good news about Jesus have more to do with life than death? A presentation of grace that begins and ends with death as the only way in surely leaves out something equally important. I think a few observations about life generally and Christian life are important in this regard. First of all, let me say this. Life is good. God invented it. And when it is lived according to his designs, it can be terrific. There is nothing better. And the designs of God that I just mentioned the laws, if you will, physical and moral, by which life is meant to be governed, are nothing less than his specifications for the beauties of his creatures. 
His law, therefore, his moral law in particular, but his physical laws as well, is precisely our beauty. And insofar as we succeed in living lawfully in this world, we enjoy our own gorgeousness just as God enjoys it. Isn't that a great thought? The law of God, moral and physical and otherwise, is the beauty of his creation. It is the beauty of his individual creatures. And when we live lawfully, when we succeed to whatever degree in living lawfully in this world, we enjoy our own beauty as God enjoys it. Moreover, even in our present fallen world, the goodness of good living is still available to us. Even in our fallen world, we can actually succeed to a degree in living lawfully, in living well, and enjoying the beauty that such living embodies. Christians, it turns out, because of this principle, in their gratitude to God for all his provision and faithfulness, continue to live and to pursue goodness of all sorts. The pleasures of recreation, the delights of the mind, the joys of relationships and mutual affection, the beauties of nature, the satisfaction of virtuous activity and charity. No lawful action, high or low, great or small, is ever an inconsiderate thing to a Christian. It is the human analog, lawful living, good living. It's the human analog to the flowering of a lily in the field from the previous passage, or to the flight of a raven in the sky. In the same way that a lily in the field thrives, or a raven seeks its food with no thought, the human creature lives lawfully and enjoys the beauty of God's creation in that particularly human way. Life is good, and lawful life is beautiful. However, but still and nevertheless, in spite of all of that, the gospel truth is that we cannot be saved now or ever by efforts at living well. The gospel truth is that the world cannot be saved by the accumulation of right decisions. If the human race could have straightened up its act by the simple pursuit of goodness, it would have done so a long time ago. We're not stupid as a race, have never been stupid as a race. And the Lord knows from Confucius to Socrates to Moses to Dr. Phil, we've had plenty of advice. But here's the thing about all that advice. You'll agree with me when I say, as a whole and on average, we have ignored it. You could say it this way. The world has taken a 5,000-year bath in wisdom, and it's just as grimy as ever. In our own lives, now, today, in the 21st century, for all our efforts to clean them up, just get grimier and grimier, don't they? Be honest. Even those of you who have walked with the Lord for years and years, who know the ins and outs of Christianity, who know the answers to all the problems of sin and weakness, may look up of, a, of an afternoon, of a morning, of an evening, whenever your anxious time hits, and realize that you're in about the same spot, morally speaking, that you've always been. Do you really imagine that your generation will witness the actual improvement of the human race? Do you imagine that you'll be better than your parents were? And that such bettering will happen on a statistically significant scale across Christendom, to say nothing of the world? If you do imagine this, you need to read more history. You need to read Cicero's famous lament, O tempora, O mores, 
which loosely translated says, what a terrible moral age we live in. People are so wicked. It has ever been thus, as the historians say. Though life well lived, according to the physical and moral laws of God, is a beautiful thing, greatly to be desired, the world cannot be saved by living. This is why the gospel focuses on something else. But this idea that the world can't be saved by living has a couple of easy reasons that I want to explain. The first reason is this. Despite our efforts, we don't ever live well enough to get the job done. Our goodness, though it reflects the beauty of God and allows us to enjoy our gorgeousness, as I said a minute ago, it's always flawed goodness. I love my children. I'm sure you love your children too, if you have them. But, but we will, both of us, if we have not already, mess them up something fierce. I'm a nice person, at least I like to think I am. You probably are too, except when my will is crossed or your convenience is not consulted. And then we are both of us so fearful that we get mean in order to seem tough. And so on and so on. Despite our partial goodness, our flaw, our sin is always in the way. The point is, if we're trying to wait for good living to save the world or to save us, we're going to wait a long time. We can see goodness. We can see the difference between doing it right and doing it wrong. And we can love the doing of it right. We can even love it enough to get a fair amount of it going. Up and running on a, on a good day. But we simply cannot crank it up to the level needed to eliminate badness altogether. The second reason that we can't be saved by living is deeper than that. It's more profound. And it is this. The problem in our hearts is not badness, it turns out. If you consider badness as a, the opposite of goodness, and the world's deepest problem is not badness as opposed to goodness. The problem is sin. And sin, that incurable human tendency to put the self first, to trust in the self, to look only to number one. Sin is what plagues us and destroys our efforts to save ourselves by good decisions, to save ourselves by good living. And since the problem is sin, as opposed to badness, means that there is nothing, no right deed, no good decision, however good, however noble, lawful, thrifty, brave, clean, reverent, there's no deed that cannot be done for the wrong reason. That cannot be tainted and totally corrupted by sin. It's worth noting in this connection that the greatest evils ever perpetrated in world history have been perpetrated with alarming regularity in the name of goodness. Look back on the history of horrible things done, of genocides and disasters and murders and rapine and pillage. Alarmingly, consistently, they are done in the name of goodness. If we finally fry this planet in a nuclear holocaust, God forbid, it will finally have been done not by a bunch of naughty little boys and girls who didn't tend to their Sunday school lessons. It will most likely have been done by grave, respectable, thoughtful people, motivated by high ideals. 
lesser evils follow the same path. They follow the same rule. When I cripple my children by my sin against them, or when my parents did it to me, it was not done out of meanness or spite. I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. It was done out of love. Genuine love, deeply felt and endlessly pondered human love. The problem is that love was and is always flawed by a self-regard so powerful and so profound that none of us ever noticed. That self-regard is deeper than all of the religious impulses we have to save ourselves by right living. And so life, it turns out, for all its goodness, the act of living for all its lawfulness and even occasional success and glorious divine beauty can never save. This is the reason that the gospel seems shy on it. Because the gospel is the good news of salvation. And the gospel message, if it's disappointment today, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but the gospel message drives us back not to life, but to death. More specifically, to faith in the death of Jesus as the only reliable guide, the only effective opposite to sin. Sin, it turns out, plays havoc with badness and goodness alike. But faith in the death of Jesus erases it. You may think, well, it's a theological proposition. Now, I want to talk a little, a little bit more about what the life that comes out of death might look like. What real Christian life, a living the death of Jesus, might look like. Perhaps an illustration of what death as a way of living involves would be helpful. The temptation, of course, if you've heard the gospel of grace and the message of the quietism and the passivity and the wait for God to come along, the temptation is to imagine death as a way of life as doing nothing at all. In fact, we even use that term sometimes. There's nothing to do in the matter of your salvation. The temptation is to see it as a, a profound quietism, you know, deadly, boring wait for actual physical death to come along and finally put an end to our misery. But I want you to try this exercise instead as a way to understand what I think the gospel means about death as a way of life. Hold out your right hand, palm up, and imagine that someone is placing in your hand, one after another, all sorts of gifts. Make them good gifts. Make them whatever you like. M&Ms. Weekends in the mountains, winning the lottery, falling in love and getting married, having perfect children, being wise and talented and good looking and humble besides. Anything you like. And now consider that there are two ways your hand can respond to all those good gifts. It can respond to them as a live hand and try to clutch and hold on to the single good that is in it at any given moment, thus closing itself to all other possible goods for the moment. It can respond by clutching. It can respond by trying to grasp the lever, as we often put it, that produces that good, the lever that whose activation causes that good to come. Or it can respond as a dead hand, in which case it will simply lie there, perpetually open to all other goods in the comings and goings of their dance, in the comings and goings by which they appear in our lives and disappear too. When the gospel talks about being dead, 
as a way of living. When the gospel talks about living out the death of Jesus, I think one of the things we should have in mind is the dead hand receiving his gifts. Not an absence of interest in the dance of living, but the absence of clutching at our partner and trying to control the steps. In a way, this is nothing new in terms of spiritual advice, right? I'm reminded of a, of a, a children's novel by uh, Lloyd Alexander, published in the 60s or 70s, I think, called Terran Wanderer. And one of the great characters in this novel is a, a guy who um, lives by a stream and gives no thought really for his future and his provision. He instead um, sits by the stream and waits for things to float down it toward him and uses them as he grabs them out of the water and pulls them to the shore, uses them to provide for his daily necessities. I'm not suggesting that we give no thought to the future in terms of financial planning or ordering our activities so as to provide for ourselves. But in matters of faith, in matters of identity, in matters of this urge which drives us to the word, which drives us to the gospel, which drives us to hear preaching and receive a word from God. In the urge we have to live rightly and be judged, I suggest that that kind of waiting to see what the stream will deposit in our open hand is a pretty good approximation of the gospel's talk about living the death of Jesus. It's quite specifically the way the gospel invites us to live. Jesus, if you, if you think about it, as our example, was obviously not without an interest in life. You ever think about the fact that he had a reputation as a glutton and a wine bibber? Probably didn't acquire that reputation by sitting at home eating tofu, drinking herb tea, or skipping all parties. But equally obviously, Jesus did not count his life, either human or divine, as something to be grasped at. He was open at all times to what God put into his hand pleasant or unpleasant, and he remained faithful in that openness until his death, indeed, accepted that death as one of the gifts of God, at which point God the Father, by the power of the resurrection, put the whole world into his hand. The dead hand, then, is the only way, here or hereafter, that life can be safely enjoyed. How is this death as a way of living possible, then? How do we get our minds around it and proceed to live that way? Well, that's why we come to hear the gospel. Hear this one more time today. In the death of Jesus that we celebrate as we take communion together, as we'll do in just a moment. In the death of Jesus, which is the once for all opening of the way of grace. In the death of Jesus, you also died. And so remain forever qualified for his resurrection. Have you lived well? Does your history include a long string of good decisions? Have you lived poorly? Do you always do it wrong? Because of the death of Jesus, neither judgment applies to you. Neither judgment applies to those who are dead in him. For all of those dead in him are qualified because of him for the resurrection. The gospel is on and on about death. 
because death is the gateway to life eternal. I want to encourage you today as we pray and take communion together to cling to the death of Jesus today. To be reminded in your soul that you are in him on the cross. And that the judgment and the sentencing that you crave in your flesh by which you hope to be justified has indeed been pronounced already. Guilty in Jesus on the cross. Not guilty because of his love and faithfulness. All of his judgment for all of your sin has been poured out once and for all. Rejoice today because of your membership in the resurrection. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us with that thought as we go forth today. And as we prepare our hearts to take communion, I pray that you would remind us of the significance of your death as the thing that makes us alive and as the model for our living in this world. Help us, Lord, to take the truth that the twin verdicts of guilty and not guilty have been pronounced over us already. Help us to take that truth into all our thinking and imagining about our own situations. Give us confidence, Lord, when we look back on our past, our past of mistakes and disasters. Give us confidence to know that you're not guilty applies to all of that. Lord, as we look forward with anxiety to the ways we're going to do it wrong in the future, give us confidence and hope that you're not guilty applies to that as well. Lord, fill us with joy as we think about it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I would like to pause a moment while we uh, pass out the communion elements. And so if you've brought them with you, go ahead and take a minute right now to distribute them among the people that are watching, that are gathered together. And when we're done with that, I will uh, read the passage and administer the communion. So I'm just going to pause the screen for just a moment here.
For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You proclaim the opening of the way into life eternal until he comes. Amen. Let's repeat the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us for a reminder of the gospel, everyone. I hope to see you next time. And until we meet again, the Lord bless and keep you.